Yes, thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Giovanni and, and Florian. Thank you all for meeting here and uh, giving me the opportunity to tell you something about a trip to Easter Island, uh, which I have taken uh, last year in 2019. Um, this is not a finished project. Uh, it's just some thoughts um, of, a, of a, some very preliminary thoughts uh, of a trip, but it made me uh, thinking and I hope you too. Uh, we can discuss that later. So um, I am interested mainly in morphology, systematics, uh, taxonomy of uh, yeah, the more strange uh, animal, myofaunal animals such as gastrotrix, cnidarians, priapulites and so on. Uh, but this trip to Easter Island was a very preliminary one because nobody ever has uh, looked at the myofauna before. So, uh, okay, how to get to the next slide, like this. Um, Easter Island is known to be the most isolated island and it's more than 2,000 kilometers to the next inhabited island, which is Pitcairn, and more than 3,500 kilometers to the continent of South America. And to get there, you enter a plane in Santiago de Chile and fly for five and a half hours until you get there. Uh, I will talk of Easter Island. The people there call it Rapa Nui or in, uh, in the airport in Santiago, it's called uh, Isla de Pascua. So there are different names. You know, someone is calling, sorry. Um, the island is volcanic in origin and it's not very old. Um, it, it consists more or less of three volcanoes uh, and the lava uh, of, of the, the lava outflow of them connects all three volcanoes. The oldest one is here, the Poike, which is about two and a half million years old. And um, yeah, of course, this ocean, oceanic, uh, this um, volcanic island is part of a chain of sea mounds um, and that will be, become important later. So an isolated island like this is ideal to ask questions about the myofauna paradox, which um, means more or less that uh, the animals, why do the animals that we think have very restricted dispersal capacities, why do they in fact seem to disperse pretty well? Um, and so how did they reach this remote and isolated island? Well, the whole, the entire Easter Island is a national park. So um, you cannot very easily do research there. You need partners. And I found my partners uh, in, on the University Católica del Norte in Coquimbo in Chile. And they have established a fascinating program called ESMOI, Ecology and Sustainable Management of Chilean Oceanic Islands and they are very active um, on Easter Island. This is also um, supported by the Chilean government and my trip was supported by the German Science Foundation, the DFG. Um, the leader of the trip, of this trip to Easter Island was um, Martin Thiel, the tall guy here, um, and his student Martin. And there was another guest researcher from the US, Jim Carlton here, and that's me in the middle. ESMOI has uh, two containers on the island that serve as uh, a small lab and I could establish a corner there with my stuff. I brought a binocular and a microscope with me because for a lot of soft-bodied animals it has been, it has turned out that it's uh, very good to uh, document these animals alive. Just when you find them, extract them and make an Im immediate documentation by photos and videos through diff different focal planes. And then you can go back home and uh, analyze your photos and videos and, and try to identify the animals there. But for that, of course, you need good um, equipment and that means carrying large microscopes with you around the world. But in the end, it really pays off. Now, most of you will have heard about um, Easter Island. It's quite fascinating. It's very remote, but still everyone has a picture in mind immediately. And you know about these stone statues several meters high 
They are called Moais. They are sitting on platforms called Ahu. Um, there are almost a thousand of these statues in total. Um, and most of them are around the island. Some of them are fallen over, some are erected. And uh, I could go on and tell you about one hour or more about the cultural background and the mysteries and what we know about the whole culture of uh, Polynesia. But unfortunately, this is not the topic of our talk today and that would go on endless. So I leave you with this uh, image of the uh, statues. But I have to say one thing, because the statues are very close to the shore, uh, like here, you see the, the beach here and the statues sitting right here. Meaning when you work on the beach or in the water nearby, you are always in so close proximity of this cultural heritage of Easter Island. And this density of culture and nature makes up a really fascinating aspect of working there. And I just loved it. And, and yeah. Uh, well, you might have heard about Easter Island in another context. Um, Jared Diamond, a famous biologist, uh, used Easter Island as a kind of story to, to um, tell what happens if humans overexploit their planet. Uh, and that is because when uh, the people from Polynesia arrived on Easter Island at around the year 1200, they found an island that was covered by a palm forest. And then uh, while the people had been there, the forest was cut down. Um, and or at first the, the culture bloomed and they uh, spent a lot of time and energy to carve and erect those stone statues. And then they went into a crisis and they have then finally they threw over all the statues. They uh, had cut every single palm. The palm is now extinct. Um, and so this is a kind of image what might happen to Earth if we don't take care of, of the Earth. Um, there is some discussion about this. Not everything might be quite like this. Um, but in the end, it's a very nice story. And uh, of course, we should take care of our planet. Um, if you look at the island today, if you drive over the island, it looks a little bit like this. So you see more or less bare ground and a lot of grasslands. This is due to uh, thousands of sheep that were brought onto the island at one point of time. They are gone now, but now hundreds of cows and uh, horses roam the island. <clears throat> and when you drive over the island with a rental car, it's inevitable uh, to meet those cows and horses. And this, of course, has the consequence that uh, you find very few native uh, organisms on the island in the terrestrial uh, sphere. For example, uh, as a European, you meet this um, flower, the clover. Um, I bet it's all over the world, but I know it only from Europe. Um, and in fact, uh, there are very, very few endemic plants that you can find on Easter Island and all very restricted and threatened. And the same is true for arthropods from the about 400 species of arthropods, terrestrial arthropods, um, only 31 are endemic. And those are restricted to very cryptic habitats like caves or cliffs. If we turn to the sea, it looks a little bit different and from um, the macroscopic organisms that we find there, we have in part quite high endemism rates. Up to one third of the fishes and mollusks are uh, endemic. And this of course makes us very curious to take a look uh, at the myofauna. But as I said, nobody has taken a look at myofauna uh, before. Um, well, because the island is volcanic, uh, it looks like this. So it's very rocky. There are not really, uh, not much sediment to see. Um, but there are two very beautiful beaches. And of course, these beaches were the first goal for me to go through. These beaches are very close together uh, on the northern edge of the, um, of the island. Uh, one is called Anakena Beach and the other is in Ovahe Bay. 
And I showed a picture of Anakena Beach before. This is because here are the, the statues very close. And this is uh, a beach that has some palms. This is not the native palm, but the, the coconut palm that was introduced later. Um, but here uh, I took some samples and I kind of fell into a trap because those that uh, from you that have more experience will know what happens now. There were really very, very few animals in the samples. And I made a, a chart here with some taxa um, that I found and you see there were single nematodes, there were single ciliates, among them this gigantic uh, Trachelorhaphis, the species that can grow up to about 800 micrometers. There were single flatworms uh, and they were likely otoplanids, which are more or less adapted to this kind of high energy um, beaches and few single polychaetes. And this is due to the fact that the sand that is there on this island is uh, biogenic and it is uh, wave beaten. It has very, very few nutrients and therefore not many organisms. If we turn over around the corner to this Ovaha Bay, you see it's the same situation. But if you then swim out a little bit and snorkel right here where it is getting dark, uh, you get different kind of sediment. This is uh, rocky ground and between the rocks are um, yeah, kind of pockets of sediment. And if you take uh, samples there, you find those animals that you would expect from most kind of beaches uh, nematodes and harpacticoids rule. They are most abundant and you also find ciliates, ace seals, flatworms, gastrotrichs, polychaetes, uh, mites and what was very special at this location there were quite a lot of mollusks and I show you an image here of these uh, myofaunal mollusks. Uh, they are really interesting and I haven't seen so many uh, mollusks any time before on any other beach. Um, you see here very nicely the statuses, the radula here and magnification. This is the food here, this is the uh, digestive sac. And um, they are now with Katharina Jörger and Timea Neusser and they uh, can already tell that it's a Paraganitus species and they have it for further identification. So that was special uh, for this kind, otherwise a quite um, normal, I would say, uh, composition of the myofauna. Our next sampling spot was on the south, um, uh, southeastern coast and it was called Punta Oroi. And here we found different um, kinds of coarse sediment, uh, different uh, yeah, pockets of the sediment close by, some sediment was very dark in color, some uh, sediment was very light in color, uh, but everything was very rich in myofauna. We find more or less the same taxa, more or less without gastropods. Um, but here we found as a, a special taxon isopods, myofaunal isopods. And uh, interestingly, in, in the one sediment, the more oval um, isopods, and in the other, this elongated type of uh, uh, isopods, which um, is well known. It's uh, probably close to the genus Microcaron. And um, it's a bachelor thesis waiting for a student to investigate these uh, isopods in more detail. And then the famous spot where uh, I took samples was in the village. The village is spreading here on this side of the island. This is the airstrip here. Uh, it's called Hangaroa and we uh, named the, the sampling spot the swimming pool and this is because it was here. It's just a part of the ocean that is set up um, by a line of stones. The waves can go over it. There's free exchange of water, but this is a kind of protected area where you can take a bath. Um, it's not more than, I would say, one and a half meters deep at, at the deepest point. So it's uh, quite good to take samples there. And here you see that most the ground is mostly rocky, but there are these pockets of sediment in between and you can easily uh, grab a handful and take a, 
a, um, a bag full of sediment uh, back for investigation. And also here you find more or less the now common image. You find all the familiar and abundant uh, taxa of myofauna uh, in this uh, yeah, swimming pool. If we put this all together, we see that the uh, sandy beaches are very poor uh, in composition, but then the other, all the other spots are very rich in myofauna and also very diverse in myofauna. Um, but more or less the things that you would expect with some highlights like the gastro, uh, gastropods or the uh, isopods. I want to show you some images and first I know that many of you are working with nematodes and uh, some also with harpacticoids. Um, I'm very sorry to say that these are not the taxa of my personal prime focus, uh, so I cannot tell you anything very specific, only that uh, epsilon nematodes were present. Um, but then flatworms, very uh, interesting flatworms, very nice uh, flatworms, among them calypterungs, or this uh, multi-eyed big flatworm, uh, very interesting. Um, then I found surprisingly many uh, polychaetes from the uh, Nerelides, Nerelidae, um, and they are now under investigation in collaboration with um, Alexandra Kerbel and Katrine Warsaw. Um, and I also found a number of ostracods among them this uh, big hairy guy here and uh, a few mites. And of course, uh, my favorite taxon uh, are the gastrotrix, for example, this Thomastoderma uh, specimen or species. And I will take a closer look at them very soon in collaboration with uh, Alexander Kieneke. If we bring this into a bigger uh, context, um, I just take a list of myofauna taxa and uh, for this I just copied the list of contents from my book, which you hopefully all know and uh, hopefully also possess. So if we then do a list of what's there and what's not there uh, and you compare it to the um, taxa that you see and know from your personal beaches, you see that on Easter Island you find more or less the taxa that you would expect uh, and the ones that you that were not there are yeah very rare to see. Um, I would expect if you do closer investigations you would I'm sure that you would find for example tardigrades and kinerings and so on but for now they were not there. So this all brings us back to the basic question of how animals got there. And I can imagine four different ways of how animals could reach uh, Easter Island. The first one is here from the deep sea floor. That would be one possibility. Um, we don't have a good basis for a comparison because we don't know the deep sea diversity pretty well. Um, and we, don't, we also don't know the um, diversity on the Chilean main coast and on the other Polynesian islands very well. So we don't have a good basis for um, comparison right now. But because the deep sea floor uh, is usually composed of soft sediments, I don't think it's very likely that the Easter Island uh, myofauna derived from the deep sea bottom especially those coarse sediment forms like the isopods, I cannot imagine that they derive from um, deep ocean taxa. Um, because Easter Island is part of a ridge of seamounts, um, this uh, stepping stone uh, theory comes into play and uh, the animals could get to Easter Island uh, by short distance dispersal from other seamounts. But this, of course, only shifts the problem to the question of how did the animals reach the ridge itself, because the, the entire ridge is also somewhat isolated uh, within the Pacific Ocean. Um, then we know that uh, myofaunal taxa can actively emerge from the sediment and be dispersed by currents. 
Uh, as far as I know, we don't know how far uh, they can be dispersed and how long they can be in the, in the water column. But I would just uh, suspect that it's not long enough to reach such an uh, isolated and distant island uh, like Easter Island. So my favorite is this fourth uh, opportunity, um, meaning that they could reach the island by rafts. And there are certainly different kinds of rafts that, that are possible. And just think about a log that is lying on a beach, on a sandy beach for quite a while, uh, taking up some sediment into its crevices. And then it gets blown out uh, to the sea and, and uh, swims to another island. And this could be one possibility um, how uh, animals got there. And we can imagine several of such rafts, uh, for example, rhizoids of uh, big algae, uh, the logs I was mentioning, you probably have heard about these pumice, floating pumice, which is volcanic porous rock that is floating on the water and can form very large, uh, dense, uh, yeah, almost islands that are floating. And through the work of our hosts, uh, Jeroen and Giovanni, we know that also turtles uh, can carry a lot of myofauna on their carapaxes and transport them over long distances. Um, and I think this, these rafts have the, the advantage that they can take up uh, tiny amounts of sediment. And within this sediment, the myofauna can stay alive maybe even over several generations, so quite um, for a longer time than I would expect for the other possibilities. So I think we should really try to look more into rafts uh, and, and uh, better evalu evaluate their possibilities to transport myofauna around the world. And um, because now humans uh, are making another kind of, of rafts, uh, by litter, by throwing litter into the sea, we have a new possibility of anthropogenic uh, litter. And by the way, we might also think about ballast sand, ballast water is well known for the transport of um, plankton. But in some places, uh, people were also using ballast sand. Uh, this is not valid for Easter Island, but probably for some other places. And this litter topic brings me back to the work of my colleagues uh, with whom I have been on the island at that point of time because they were taking care of the litter, um, cleaning the beaches for the purpose of looking at the litter uh, for some uh, macrofauna that, that was sitting on it, corals, bryozoans and other organisms. Uh, and you can see here already there, there are organisms sitting on it and if you take a closer look, uh, a rope like this also has very tiny crevices um, in which theoretically also myofauna could be transported or in holes of, of other litter and so on. So litter can also be a useful raft uh, to transport the animals. Well, we found very nice things, by the way. For example, these bryozoans, they have found their own uh, vehicle to go to Easter Island. And I think if we think about it a little bit more, we might also, um, or also some other things might uh, come into our mind of how, uh, how things get transported over the water for quite longer distances. Okay, I've been talking quite quickly because I felt some pressure because I had so many slides, but now I'm through very soon. And I thank you all for your attention. I thank the ESMOI and DFG uh, for the support and all the people that have been uh, with me on the island or are working with the Easter Island organisms right now. And um, yeah, probably a lot of questions have come up and I'm very happy to discuss them with you all. Uh, right now. Thank you very much.